You're listening to Scaling Impact, the number one podcast for conscious entrepreneurs changing the world. Today on the podcast, I talk with Salim Ismail. Salim is the best-selling author of Exponential Organizations and a serial tech entrepreneur whose previous company, Angstro, was purchased by Google in 2010. He led Yahoo's internal incubator and is currently an XPRIZE Foundation board member, the founding executive director of Singularity University, and the chairman of XO Works, EXO Works. In this episode, we talk about cryptocurrencies, Moore's law of technological advancement, and hugely disruptive technologies that currently exist that the average person doesn't know about. We also cover how Elon Musk creates companies, masculine and feminine archetypes of emerging technology, and the anatomy of exponential companies with specific examples from around the world. Interesting topics covered include cutting edge technology the average person doesn't know about, the power of cryptocurrencies, the immune system response large companies and legacy industries have that often kills off internal innovation, how Elon Musk creates new companies by looking 10 years into the future, and examples of existing companies using exponential technology to positively impact humanity. All right, so first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today in Toronto uh, for the interview, a conversation that we want to have about exponential technology. Scaling impact is all about uh, the scaling side, growth, metrics, how to get a solution to everyone in the world who wants and needs it as quick as possible, uh, as well as the impact side, which is, yeah, why do those people need it? Is it a little cheesy? product or service. No, it's it's a major solution that needs to scale quickly, likely because there's a problem that's scaling almost as fast as the solution needs to scale. Right. So I'd love to ask you a few questions, but just to start off, I know that you do these sessions sometimes at Singularity University where you've done a lot of work uh, and some of your own events as well, just about emerging tech. But there's a lot of people that don't know actually what exists today. So the statement that I have in my mind is the future is here. There are things going on right now that exist, technologies that exist that haven't got to the general populace. And in your days, even way back uh, with other organizations, you would review thousands of pieces of technology and pick the top five that you'd go after in the market and decide we want to disrupt this industry now. Can you tell us about what you've come across in the last few years that you don't think the average person knows about that currently exists, technology that, that could have an impact on on the way things move in the forward. In the um, yeah, there's a bunch of them. I mean, what's fascinating and amazing about our world is that uh, every month is a total surprise, right? When I think about my f faculty colleagues at Singularity, um, uh, every month something happens and they go, oh my God, can you do that? And, and that's them, <laughs> that's us. And so it's kind of insane because we have a dozen technologies now all moving on this doubling pattern. Mm -hmm. And this is totally unique. We've never seen this before in the history of mankind. And each one of them is doubling about every year in its capability. But where they intersect, you've got a four times multiplier. Right. right? And so the aggregate effect is kind of unbelievable. So um, just to back up, Moore's Law is what you're referring to there. Yeah, the Moore's Law and the equivalent of that is now occur occurring in like a dozen technologies. So Moore's Law doubles every 18 months the number of transistors on a chip or the price performance. But we're doubling dr the capability of drones every nine months. Uh, we're doubling the resolution at which we can image the brain about every year. We're doubling the speed at which we can sequence the human genome every five months. It's just unbelievable. And the um, cost. In and the cost then drops by 50% in those doubling patterns as well. Right? right. So you get two types of doublings. Either I can do that many more computations per second or that much more resolution, or my existing solution drops by 50%. Mm -hmm. right? so, the, so just as an example, the LiDAR unit at the top of a Google car which does all the navigation, light radar, they call it. Um, five, six years ago, that cost $75,000, one of these units. Okay? But, there, but today, that costs $40. Wow. Right? And that price change of that uh, kind of intensity is unreal. And, and if you go a bit to somebody in the car industry and go, that's where it's going to be in five, six years, they will laugh you out of the room. Because they can't forecast. Because it's not possible. It's impossible. And this mm -hmm. is the enormous challenge that we have, but also the huge opportunity. So if you don't spot these doubling patterns and the aggregate effects early, you get totally disrupted. One little thing that we joke around about is people often say five to ten years, and we always say, you mean five to six? Because yeah. Because the sixth year is the tenth year when you're no, looking you're, exponentially. Totally, this is the huge difficulty of getting your head around exponentials and doubling mm -hmm. patterns, right? It's the last hop. 
that is like way more than everything else that ever happened. Right. Right. So it, Moore's law starts out with two transistors, then four transistors, then eight. But now then you get to a billion and two billion and four billion. You get to four billion transistors and you go, there's no way in 18 months we're going to scram eight billion transistors onto the same chip. And then it freaking happens. Yeah. And everybody goes, oh, my God. And so this, this kind of uh, this pattern goes on nonstop. And so in a dozen technologies, the intersections are providing unbelievable. So let me give you the few, three or four kind of most exciting breakthroughs that we think we're, I'm, I'm seeing. One is solar energy is doubling every two years. Uh, within 13 years, we will be able to deliver 100% of world energy supply with solar. Mm -hmm. And that completely changes the, goal, the game globally. And that takes into account the demand curve as well? Uh, no, the, future, the, the capabilities there, you may not hit it all the applications. Or, right, right. Like jet engines probably won't transmit into solar in 13 years. They may For take sure. 30 years or yeah, 40 yeah. years. But the, the, you know, the last oil price crash was because of a 2% oversupply in the market. It's a really tightly won market. Right. So 1% more in solar, 5% more in solar totally destroys the energy markets. Wow. Right? So we think in the next couple of years, there's another oil price crash. And uh, 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 it'll go to about 20, 18 to 20 bucks a barrel. And it will never come back. Mm. So the Athabasca oil sands, done. Yeah. Right? Fracking in the short term, solar in the long term. Yeah. We have to totally. And, and exports are 40% of the of, of Canadian exports, oil. Yeah. And so totally need to refactor the basis of the economy here in the next 10 to 15 years. Wow. And that's a kind of a pretty huge challenge. So that's just energy. But more importantly, on a, on a more kind of optimistic note, the poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world. Right. So now you totally turn the tables in terms of all of this. So that's one. The second thing I would think is, is a major one is, is cancer. Um, we think cancer gets handled in the next three to four years, mostly through early detection. But now we have treatments like CRISPR that can also do later stage cancer treatments and gene and editing. Gene editing. Uh, but there's all sorts of other things, immuno, uh, passive immunotherapy that are coming along. And so uh, the, we have now multiple mechanisms where we can a attack a cancer in very profound ways. Then we have CRISPR, where mm -hmm. you can edit the human genome. There are 10,000 uh, diseases that are genetic diseases that can't be addressed today at all. Uh, sickle cell anemia, you know, things like that. And now we can address those with, uh, with CRISPR. So something that was, ne it was not even, you couldn't do, you could, just couldn't treat it, and now you can. And so th that's very exciting. I think that we're going to see unbelievable breakthroughs in neuroscience as we have a feedback loop we can now image. We can now spot a single neuron firing in your brain in real time. Uh, and so the feedback loop that comes from that is incredible because now we can put something in front of you and, and then you get really esoteric. You start to get really wild precognition effects mm -hmm. around some of the stuff where you, you can actually, the person actually knows what's going to come up on a random screen before it actually comes up. ESP. It's kind of. almost like ESP, but but um, so they've done tests where you you have a ran a, a very violent image like a war or or torture or something, mm -hmm. and a very passive image like sunset or whatever, and you flash. There's a test where you flash it in front of a person, and the computer is randomly ta picking this thing. After being entrained for a while, the person can tell the person's nervous system reacts before a violent image, but not before a passive image. Mm. And the time is crazy. It's before even the computer has done the algorithm wow. to say which image should I show. So that really breaks, like, that's kind of breaks all sorts of weird quantum rules. And I, let's not get into that because yeah. that's a rat hole <laughs> and that requires quite a lot of alcohol. Yeah. But, but, you know, that now we can play with the stuff with crazy fidelity. Mm -hmm. I just came across three days ago a drone that can now, it kind of hovers in the air. And it goes underwater and it propels underwater now, the drone. Hmm. So this is kind of pretty cool. Submersible. Submersible drone, right? Now that you can go, you're not limited to air or water, and you can do either. And so that hmm. there's some, just a kind of aggregate effect of all of this is unbelievably profound. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about the intersections between them in different industries. Yeah, we so take all of, the all of all cryptocurrencies are an intersection of computation and cryptography. Mm -hmm. And now you have this whole domain that could never existed before. Right. right. And it seems to be that some people, I think you've even mentioned it as a Gutenberg effect, or where there's a new, there's another thing called the hummingbird effect, I think that was in uh, uh, one of the cool books on innovation, uh, six big innovations over history. But the type of innovation where we're inventing such and such, and we actually have no idea how that's going to be used. Yeah. Because there's this effect where it's like... Um, you don't see it for a long time. You, you yeah. can't project all of the applications. Like no. The internet is a good example of, yeah. we know how we're going to use this maybe we'll be able to chat with each other. 
like they couldn't think of beyond uh, like a little bit of communication and right. some billboards and stuff like that. I actually would argue that that's the case with most of these. Mm -hmm. um, you take cryptocurrencies or blockchain and you have the same basic paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. I remember talking to Martin Cooper who invented the cell phone. And I said, did you, you know, think, dream one day there'd be 7 billion cell phones out in the world? And he's like, hell no, I was just trying to compete with AT&T across the street. And absolutely <laughs> no, no idea or no intent. He just invented something and off he went. And what's really magical today on top of the fact that you have all these technologies is the cost is almost zero. Mm -hmm. It used to be that advanced technologies cost a lot. Right. And today advanced technologies don't cost very much and therefore you have this incredible explosion of of entrepreneurs all over the world playing mm -hmm. with them with no downside. Yeah, I actually went to neurofeedback training uh, uh, intensive with a few uh, coworkers and friends, and, and it was quite expensive. And a lot of when I came back, everyone was asking about it, and I told them about it, and they said, "Oh, it might be nice, you know, the privilege to be able to do something." Like that. I said, "Yeah, but I also am the pioneer. The pioneer pays ten times the price." Yeah. So in five years, everyone's going to be able to do this for super cheap. You're an early and, adopter. And yeah, yeah, early adopters have to pay the most. Um, Brad Templeton calls early adopters um, stupid people with too much money. No, no insult <laughs> yes. intended. Because you will shell out for the iPhone 19 with the 0.5 more features than the iPhone 18.5, right. etc. Oh, right. and there's certain things I like to be an early adopter on. Other ones, you know, I don't really care about. So it's with your priorities and your values. Yeah. But it seemed like a really big one. And I remember actually the person running the neurofeedback clinic talked about how um, he's really frustrated because he can't get very, um, there's a lot of things you can't quite measure externally. He said, we would actually need an implant in your, in your brain in order to monitor it. And I was thinking, well, that's probably going to come soon. But also, you're, you're misjudging the potential of technology a little bit. Yeah. Because we've always thought, like, oh, it just couldn't be a lot more powerful than what it is now. Yeah. But I'm sure it will be. No, in fact, Mary, um, I can't remember, but the company Openwater may have solved that problem. Wow. They're looking at doing uh, very granular, deep brain detection from the surface. Non-invasive. Yeah. yeah. And the industries that combine there. So then you start to get into biotech as well, because as soon as it's in you or... Yeah, you know, it's monitoring you. Yeah, the human mind starts to learn pretty rapidly certain things, and, and then the capabilities, we don't know what they will be at and, the end. And, and with the discovery possibilities, right? We have still have no idea why we sleep. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, we have no idea. So now with a feedback loop, we can kind of play with different things, see what's happening in the brain, figure out why mm -hmm. certain functions are there. Um, there. They do theorize that there may be quantum phenomena in the brain. Uh, which means it won't be deterministic, which is a big ch a question mark. In yeah, the, I have a feeling your... there's a little bit of quantum in uh, every particle. Yeah. So I would assume that it's in us too. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to large, well, I guess big evolutionary technologies that come out and disrupt, there's always that period of time. There's equilibrium. You've talked about there's a period of, I guess, dynamic tension that comes out of that where everything's kind of going awry and then it goes back into equilibrium with emerging tech. So you just talked about some things that exist right now that are disruptive, that are almost undervalued by, by the people that are taking estimates on how things are going to change. Right. What are the emerging? So when you see the two, can you give an example or two of the two things coming together, two industries to form this new? Oh, I mean, it's uh, across any of them. OK, so take solar and transportation you put a solar panel on a fishing boat, and now you don't need an engine. Mm. And then there's an environmental spin-off. Yeah, and so you're done. You don't need fuel depots, you don't need maintenance for the motors, you don't need any of that. It's a small electric power, propeller powered thing, which is totally fine for a fishing boat. In fact, they did this in Vietnam, this fishing village had a, a ship coming to deliver diesel once a month, ship stopped coming. And they have literally no power for their fishing boats. They invented a solar power boat. Mm. So we have now disruptive innovation using cutting edge technologies happening at the edge of civilization. Right? Right. When those guys get their hands on crypto and drones and, and CRISPR, <laughs> crazy things are going to mm. happen. Yeah, necessity but, is the mother of invention. Yeah. And we found that when you, technology is a major driver of progress in the world. Right? And, and it actually might be the only major driver of progress. And now that we have a dozen of these moving this quickly, the progress that will come is unbelievable. So mm -hmm. we're kind of incredibly excited watching what's coming, focus at will, neurological breakthroughs, biotech breakthroughs, et cetera. It's, it's kind of across the board. Yeah. I just got off the uh, phone this morning with a startup that's creating a, a sensor-based pad for, your, for sleeping, and they can tell when hospital patients might get bed sores or not 
just from the reaction and the weight on each part of the pad. Right. And now you can totally solve for that, which you couldn't solve for for like a thousand years. Hmm. Right? And so it's kind of incredible. And that's why, we, why I'm so optimistic about the world. We have some major issues, but the technology coming to solve them. So I make the comment that we have 20 Gutenberg moments hitting us at the same time today. Right, and right? it's overwhelming for a lot of people. And, and you know that physiologically, excitement and nervousness are the same feeling. Yeah. And we ascribe a different meaning to them based on when you're going on stage or when you're you know, just excited with your friends. A lot of people feel that feeling and they don't know how to interpret it. Am I excited or am I darn nervous about? Yeah, or speak? am I freaked out? Yeah, yeah. how do you um, calm people once they start, like say they're doing a three day intensive or something like that? You know, we, we actually do, you need a little bit of the freak out and the nervousness to shake things up and open the door for transformation and change in mindset. Right. If everybody's sitting there going, oh, I know all of this, then you have no access. Mm. So you freak them out a little bit. And the trick is, in the art is how much do you do that? If you take it too far, their brains break. Right. right? I, I did a session with um, 60 partners of a $3 billion risk management division of a big accounting firm. Uh, and they're like, you know, we don't know what you're going to tell us because we live in risk. <laughs> it's what we do. And I was like, I, you know, how far do you want me to turn this dial? And the CEO's not go for it. We, we, this is what we do. I'm like, oh, okay. So I, so I went full out. At the end, there was this like pin drop silence. And the rest of their two-day conference was completely useless because they couldn't put their brains back into their heads. Right. And I'd gone too far, basically. Mm -hmm. right? And so you have to kind of find the right amount to unnerve people enough, but give them the path through where things can go because right. the path forward is unreal. I mean, an easy one is just consider the fact that in a few years we'll be able to mostly handle cancer. cancer mm -hmm. right? Just that in, we're spending half a million per patient on average today. Solving, just solving for that becomes unbelievable. Well, and I used to have a lot of people feel like there's a whole industry that's kind of grown up alongside cancer that is very difficult to disrupt because yes. there's a lot of authorities there and people making a lot of money in that industry. But with the individual gaining more power in these young startups or, you know, like you said, the people on the fringes of societies or civilizations being able to contribute to yeah. these things, it, they don't need permission. No, and, and this is the, the, probably the biggest metaphysical shift that's happening in the world. We're, we're moving from a centralized, top-down, command and control, hierarchical management structure of the world, right? Judeo-Christian religions, uh, the corporation, the military-industrial complex all operate on this basis. But we're moving that modality, and I would call that a male archetype. Right? And we're moving to a much more female archetype, Burning Man, the maker movement, the open source movement, et cetera, are all participatory, nurturing, cross-linking, mm -hmm. uh, networked. Yeah. Um, and the tension that we see in the world is the transition from A to B. Right. Uh, and, in a, and in a world where you have an abundance of information or energy or whatever, you need a female type of archetype to mm -hmm. move it. Because when the male archetype relates to abundance, they relate to it as power. Right. And they try and hoard it. Mm -hmm. right? Middle East oil, Wall Street money, whatever. When the female archetype meets abundance, they share it around. Right. And, and, and so we need that archetype to kind of pop up a lot more. And I don't mean gender, because it's right. important to con uh, talk about just the archetype. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the new structures like DAOs and other things are coming along saying, okay, let's organize the world in a totally mm -hmm. different way. Yeah, how can we create, it gets difficult in blockchain where you're like trying to disrupt the central authorities in a certain regard, not by intentionally doing that, but just by allowing more people to have individual power. Yes. But then you don't want to become the central authority yourself. No, exactly. Like having the discipline to do that is having, really, really tricky. And that's where the DAOs, decentralized yeah. autonomous organizations become very interesting. But it's still a little bit theoretical at this point, I think. It is. I think we're starting to see the governance models for it, and then we'll automate them. I think we can get to the distributed first and then get to the automation later. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to large organizations, you walk into these organizations, you tell them about some of these things that are coming. Uh, you've talked about a nervous system or yeah. a uh, immune response that you've yeah. seen in the past, uh, which is, can you explain the, the immune response and then how you've decided to help solve for that? Sure. This is one of these kind of hidden problems that people don't really see. And then you see it and you go, oh, yeah. And so the immune system response is if you try and do anything disruptive in any legacy organization, the immune system attacks you. Okay. Think about... Copernicus talking to the church, saying, wait a minute, the planets, you know, we don't, the sun doesn't rotate around us, it's the other way around. Immune system response, kill that heretic, right? Mm -hmm. That's the response. Or the orthodox element in every religion kind of aims this way. But any organization like a company, 
uh, Kodak invents the digital camera and the rest of the company goes, no, 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 that can't be right. We're doing things this way. Uh, and we've always done things. And the best analogy I have is like a Roman army operating in a phalanx formation, marching along with shields and spears with a very, very specific objective to it. You come in from the side, you're going to get speared. Right? It doesn't matter how nice you are or whatever, it's just the sheer momentum and that will kill you. Mm -hmm. And this is the enormous challenge we have because all of our organizations are architected for efficiency and for predictability. And they're geared to doing the same thing repeatedly. We've got finely tuned processes, KPIs, mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, or, or, or reporting rules, et cetera, et cetera. But now the world doesn't operate on that thesis. Now the world is operating on how agile, fast, flexible, adaptable are you. Mm -hmm. And these old organization structures are very brittle, anti-fragile, top-down. They're not, they're not well suited. It's like the dinosaurs, mm -hmm. not suited for the Cambrian explosion, mm -hmm. right? The food sources all disappear, et cetera. And this is what we see. And you see this today in the stock price of, say, GE, where you've got this company selling brilliant at making massive machines. And we're entering a world where we just don't need the massive machines. Right? We need little, small, lots of small servo motors doing things, mm -hmm. and and the marketplace is disappearing on them. And so the challenge is the, the when you try anything disruptive, you get this fight back, and this is a teacher u teachers unions fighting education, or Uber and the taxis fighting, uh, banks fighting Bitcoin. It's pervasive across every time you try and introduce new new technology into society. Maybe the most caricatured example I have is is the car dealerships fighting Tesla. Right, all the car dealerships are like, we're really protecting the consumer. And you're like, really? You're telling me you're, you're the most extractionary, predatory kind of business there is almost, <laughs> and you're telling me you're there for to protect the consumer. The the irony around it is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the, the the Teslas don't need maintenance, and these car dealerships, to your earlier point, make all their money on maintenance, mm -hmm. and therefore this is enormously threatening to all of the legacy. Mm -hmm. And how do you transition through that? is almost all of the work I do now, is how do you solve this problem? And what we're excited about is we actually think we have a path forward. Right, it's controversial, but it's very similar language to the SEC uh, and what they're using around blockchain is that they're really protecting the average yes. person uh, and you know from the risk of the cryptocurrency world and things like that. And there's a certain element to it. Like, well, are you protecting the average person from being at this investment class? You know, like you're actually classing them out as not there, there's that also, and, and then we forget the systemic risk of the fact that this, like this economic, economic recovery of this last 10 years is almost completely from printing money. There's actually no underlying productivity increases. We're just mm -hmm. printing money. So all we're doing is taxing future generations. And then you say you're protecting the consumer. Wait a minute. The systemic effects are blowing the world apart. Right. right? I read um, three days ago, we are 200 as a, as a globe. As a global economy, we are $250 trillion in debt wow. globally. And global GDP is about $83 trillion. So we're three times over leveraged on debt globally. This is not sustainable. Right. There's just no way. And so at some point, it's all going to collapse in a heap. And, and people are just riding this train off the cliff going, oh. And then your point is, yeah, we're trying to protect the little consumer. Meanwhile, the systemic problems you're causing over here are killing the whole world. Right. And I think the consumers are becoming smarter. So they're starting to hear that language and they're thinking, you know what, maybe I'll make that decision for myself. Right. Uh, you know, I'd love to have the opportunity and, and I can, you know, there's, the information is not scarce anymore. Right. We, you don't need to protect us from the things we don't know. We could do a few Google searches and find out. Yeah. We could go and do a Princeton course online for free to learn this stuff. <laughs> exactly. Um, Okay, so when it comes to the immune system response, when you go into organizations, what are you doing to prevent that? Because it would be really sad, and I've seen it myself, where you, you're trying to help, you see the immune system respond and kind of counterattack whether it intends to or not, and it can ruin some of the progress that you've created. So yeah. you've obviously been incentivized to create a solution there. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, we're going to see, we, uh, if you don't adapt today, you're facing existential threat because you just don't have the time. Right? So we see this with big companies. We find that large organizations, any kind of Fortune 1000 company, when they wake up and realize that these, all these new technologies, on average, we found it takes about three years for the entire C-suite to fully wake up and, and smell the roses. Because some executive will go to Silicon Valley and go to Singularity or an MIT disruptive course, come back with their hair on fire going, oh my God. And back at headquarters, he sounds crazy. Right? So two things happen. Either he'll do, mute his, his kind of uh, protestations to fit in again, in which case the organization loses, or 
He's going, oh my God, we're totally screwed. And the organization goes, you're nuts. Please stand over there. Here's a white coat and some medicine. Try not to bother us while we do the important work, mm -hmm. right? And they ignore him. So either way, it doesn't work. It's a, it's a lose. Mm -hmm. Typically, then somebody else will go and come back and go, oh my God, the world is totally not a lot, a lot. Then they'll triangulate and say, okay, what's going on? They'll have somebody like me or Peter, or one of us types, go and do a talk there. Then they'll do the Silicon Valley tour. Then they'll kind of get their next round of management woken up. And finally, it takes on our average about three years. And we saw this repeatedly. And I was talking to the global CEO of Procter & Gamble who said, hey, we'd like to engage with you. The book is required reading, et cetera. And I said, we're about to go into this three-year dance. But I've been thinking about, can you shrink it? And so we created what we now call the EXO Sprint, which is a 10-week process that we run inside large organizations mm -hmm. that solves this immune system problem. And the value proposition is, let's move your leadership, culture, and management thinking three years ahead in 10 weeks. And we piloted it with Procter & Gamble, and it worked like incredibly well. Uh, and I thought, okay, maybe that was a fluke because p is really advanced and et cetera. And this change management, will it really stick, et cetera. So we watched that for a bit. We tried it a second time with a, a Mexican family-owned regulated insurance company. A way tougher proposition. Uh, worked even better. And then we got excited. And then we thought, okay, we've got... So we've, we've now run it about a dozen times with global blue chip companies. And we've documented the process very thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And the new book that's come out Exponential transformation basically documents that that methodology in detail. We're basically open sourcing it. Open sourcing it is that what Fast Track, uh, your organization, Fast Track is involved uh, so, with? So so EXO works on open sourcing the methodology. Okay. Fast Track is a nonprofit that says let's take that same process and apply it to the public sector. Because gotcha. in the public sector, the existing policy is the immune system, right? You try and update mm. monetary systems with Bitcoin, and the SEC goes nuts. You try and update tax transportation and the taxis freak out. You're trying to update education and the teachers unions freak out, mm -hmm. right? The state of Texas last year banned telemedicine yeah. because the doctor's lobby said, well, surely you have to go see a doctor for every little spot on your hand, which can't possibly be analyzed via 3D imaging and a camera and, and whatever. You have to go see the doctor physically. And therefore, then some of the top telepresence companies in the world are in Texas and they're like, what the hell are you doing? This is insanity. Mm -hmm. And so we have right now this, this response. And in the, in the, what Fast Track Institute tries to do is how do you solve that problem in the public sector? And we've, we think we've actually cracked that as well. Because it's more difficult. I spent 10 years as a public servant. Yeah, so I, and way I harder. Was doing innovation. So I was known as this oh young, God. young guy. that was all for the arrows in your back <laughs> from, from that. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a lot easier now. I actually used to joke that like, oh, you know, it's, it's so easy to do innovation when there's no real restraints. It's when you're in the bureaucracy with all the red tape to be able to do innovation. Way harder. And in public sector, you have navigation. multiple stakeholders, right? You've got mm -hmm. government, you've got big companies, you've got citizens, you've got yeah. existing infrastructure. And the later mm -hmm. projects I was doing were public-private partnerships. Yeah. So, you know, 30-year-long, you know, $4 billion project with tons of stakeholders, native lands involved, yeah. and all the different uh, jurisdictions in those lands. So tons of stakeholders on every side trying to get their objectives met, right? Uh, which becomes very bureaucratic. Or if you're going to run it like a committee, it becomes very difficult to make decisions and to move forward with consensus-based models. There tends to be a little bit more of an objection-based model yes. in corporate, where it's like the leadership wants to do this. Any objections? Uh, yeah, it might ruin this department. Yeah, we've thought about that. <laughs> Any other objections? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot quicker, although it's a little more hierarchical or authoritative. But public sector is much harder. So we've adapt, we've run the process a few times. It takes 16 weeks because of the public sector, but it works. And the value proposition we walk in with is, let's see if we can take a problem that you're dealing with, say transportation or corruption or education or healthcare. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can solve it for one tenth of what it's currently costing. Right. Right. And that dramatic shift gives you an incentive and a kind of a clear end goal. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've run it a few times in Medellin in Colombia. Uh, we run it with the mayor of Miami on public transportation. And we just ran the same 16-week process with the president of Colombia and the Supreme Court uh, to redo the justice system in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty excited. It's not fully as fully bedded down as the private sector one, but it's kind of 70% there. There's definitely a pony in there. A couple more iterations and we'll have it really... And then we'll open source that as well. Right. And one of the cool elements of the interconnected global world is that if one central authority, say the government of Canada, says we don't want to be part of that, yeah. then it's very easy for another country to pop up and say, we'll handle everyone in the world that wants that. Bingo. 
and, and there's a bit of a competitive tension across nationalities to provide certain things globally that other people are, are afraid of. And sometimes the small David countries tend to be the ones that go against the Goliaths and say. In, in fact, I will, I will argue that in the past few hundred years, it's been a huge advantage to be a big country because you have abundance of natural resources, you have critical mass and multiple industries, and you totally muscle out mm. smaller countries and, and kind of throw your weight around. But today it's a massive liability to be a big country, mm -hmm. right? Because it it's take, you have to bring whole population around, it takes forever to make decisions, trying to manage the complexity, say, of the US, where different segments of the population, just completely or totally different people, mm -hmm. just doesn't work. And today it's a huge advantage to be a small adaptable country yeah. or region than a big monolith country. And every major country in the world is a mess, yeah. right? China's a mess, Russia's a mess, the US is a mess, Brazil is a mess, India's a mess. It's a hell of a, it's, it's chaos. Out there. And it has to do with the rate of adaptability. Yes, adaptability and also uniformity, say in India, uh, or say Brazil, right? Trying to bring along uh, 200 million people into the right way of thinking or into a different way of thinking when you've got all of the past chaos and corruption to boot is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. This is just not going to work today in the world where information is so freely available and misinterpreted and special interests are pulling people apart, etc. Mm -hmm. I saw a good example of this with, uh, we went to a blockchain conference a couple of weeks ago in New York. And there was a whole session all about, it was kind of like how to create a currency exchange in, in Europe. And it was like a how-to and they started talking and they almost tricked people into attending uh, because when they got there they said that they've looked at all the legal changes that need to be made and all the entities within the European Union that need to agree to these things in order for all of Europe, the European Union, to be able to move forward. And they said literally if everyone approved it at every single stage it would take five years. Yeah. So we know that it's not happening. Yes. Certainly in the next five years for the European Union. Yeah. Therefore, Gibraltar and other places are starting to jump up and say, we're not gonna wait five years to do something we could literally do this year. Yeah. Um, so it just shows that like the, the levels of bureaucracy, the level of the collective all having to agree before you can move forward a step. Never gonna work. No, and so there's This is why the UN is, is a mess and needs to be restructured. And it seems important. to be when you use the masculine and feminine model or archetypes, you can see one in nature everywhere yeah. working beautifully and you can see one not very found in nature. Yes. Uh, that seems to have a lot of problems with it. <laughs> so, and my favorite definition of technology, uh, there's a book called The Nature of Technology by Arthur something, I forget his last name, but he said technology is, he said it more fancy, but technology is the stuff that harnesses natural phenomenon. Okay. You know, whether it's your body, yep. you know, harnessing all the natural phenomenon going on here, whether it's your phone or really complex technology. So it just seems, when I think like that, I think, well, we have to get really in touch with what's going on in the natural phenomenon. Yes. In order to know how to make the internet, we would have had to understood, you know, maybe the way mushrooms, uh, they have this uh, kind of interneted system. That yes. They're the first living thing and they figured out how to send nutrients and download from one tree and upload to another to help save a tree. Yeah. There's all these crazy capabilities that are natural in the systems that we're just learning about with the next layer of science showing, which means as we learn these things, we can actually start to build things intelligently and not stumble upon them. Right. As, hey, this seems to work. I don't know why, but, you know, we can send light through a wire and it goes really fast. <laughs> and, and then you have, uh, there are, I think there's the natural form and then there's unbelievable advanced mathematics that we can apply to different things. For example, we laid down unbelievable amounts of fiber thinking this is the this is how, what the density that it'll need. And now we find that compression technologies have increased so much that we've laid down like thousands of times more fiber than we'll ever need, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you can put all of the world's voice telecommunications today down one fiber optic cable. Wow. Just, <laughs> this is just unreal. And so this is the, you have both sides of the coin and they need to work together, which is the hard part. So the individual, I want to get away from big organizations uh, and some of the problems that they're handling. It seems to equally benefit the individual. So whenever there's a problem for the big organizations or the collectives, the individual seems to, the, the power goes away from the central authorities yes. and toward the fringes or toward the individuals. So what is the benefit that the individuals have now in society? There, there's immen oh. immense benefits to the point where I know you're really excited about it. I'm very excited about it. Yeah. But I'm, I can't actually understand how other people aren't or they aren't very active in this right now. Why isn't there, you know, 100,000 people doing what we're doing right now? 
talking about how we <laughs> well, start to use I, this. I think part of it is if, you're, if you've worked 30 years in a bank, then the large organization is the modus of operandi and the locus point, uh, um, focal point of how we've organized governments, big companies, and that, they make all the changes. In the past, all disruptive innovation came from government labs or large corporate labs, all of it. But today, now, any individual can Due to take, cost. That due was, to cost, what else? barriers to entry, but mostly cost, right? It just costs a lot to figure stuff out and do research and do R&D and so on. But today, you get like two guys trying two things together because the cost of a neuroscience helmet is so low. Mm -hmm. you, anybody can do anything. So this is, I'll give you an easy way of thinking about this. In the, in the 80s and 90s, there were maybe five or 10 solar companies emerging per year. And somebody would get excited about solar and care for solar. And the energy companies would buy them and shut them down mm -hmm. because they don't want solar. And so that went out pretty well. But now the cost of solar is so low, there's 5,000 solar companies. And you can't shut down 5,000. And therefore, the, ex the explosion happens or cryptocurrencies, right? Mm -hmm. It's never going to come from a central bank. We, we know from history that disruptive innovation always, always comes from outside your domain, outside your sector. It's somebody from the outside going, hey, what about this? not knowing what they don't know, and all of a sudden it's a huge impact somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And Elon Musk may be the best example of this. No experience in any of the industries he's operating in. And his methodology, by the way, is really simple. He looks at a technology that's accelerating exponentially. He aims 10 years out. Where will that technology be in a 10-year doubling pattern? He aims to build a company to inter intercept that curve in 10 years. Then he hits the vertical part of the curve and boom, things explode. Mm -hmm. If he can get there, great. And he's just about gotten there now with three or four of his companies. Uh, and that's really simple to do. And he can take on more risk than a big company can, mm -hmm. which is very risk averse. Right. Right? It doesn't matter. And it used to cost you know, tens of millions of dollars to set up a Silicon Valley software company. Tens of millions of dollars is now down to about five or $10,000. Mm -hmm. So it means if you build a company and you fail, who the hell cares? Right. You've lost five or 10 grand. So there's that much, that explosion of, of effort because of the low cost it means anybody can go off and do this, and everybody is. Mm. You know, Vitalik Buterin. Great example. His professor said, you can't really do this with crypto. And he went, that with you guys. And he did. Right? Mm -hmm. and so, Ethereum. Yeah. Extraordinary possibilities now. With, with, and I'm incredibly inspired by this younger generation. Mm -hmm. Well, this, the big organizations are actually taking the startups model and trying to incorporate it into their model. Yes. And, and when it was too incorporated, the immune system would kill it off or yes. impede it. So they actually had to put the startups at the very fringe. Edge. They sometimes call it skunk works or yep. black ops. Yep. So, sometimes those startups are actually trying to invent the thing that could kill the primary business. Yeah. Where in it could in be a totally like, healthy yeah. organization, you would fund an entrepreneur or an incubator or a skunk work and say, go build whatever it is that's going to attack us because we better be doing it. Because either today you're either the disruptor or you're mm -hmm. disrupted. Like there's no middle ground. You have to just pick which side you're on. Yeah, we've been we've built things in the past or startups that we're familiar with where you know that the company that's not launching this already has it built. Yeah. They have it built and they're ready, they're putting their finger above the button. That's right. Waiting for someone else to launch this and they're ready for that. Yeah. So the, the payments industry is famous for this. But they'll, but they'll take all the money in the meantime. That's right. From the current They'll model. milk it as much and they respond to competitive <laughs> threat and roll it out only when they have to. Yeah, only yeah. when they have to eat their own business model right. with the new one. So in terms of that empowerment, the potential that startups have to actually solve major, like humanity's major problems, you know, yeah. clean water, all the sustainable development goals that the United Nations, I think there's 17 of those that the world's kind of agreed that are major problems that we could take on. A lot of people for all of history have always waited for other people to solve those things. You know, they felt so powerless. Now they actually have more power than they even know and more ability, it's, it's cheaper to start this, start an organization, whether it's a nonprofit, a charity, or a business. And the reason we tend to push people toward the business side of things, whether it's a B Corp, which is for benefit, right. uh, and you can actually work into your mandate, like the, the things you're not gonna prioritize shareholder value over, or just regular corporations uh, that you can be flexible with. But there's, there's a lot of tension around how to go about making good through business. And I think scaling impact is the whole idea that they all, they belong together. They do. The ability to scale comes from profit, and we believe profit is the fuel for the mission. Yes. It's not the mission itself. And I think the shareholders that run these organizations 
indirectly lose sight of that sometimes that this is a means that they're yeah. benefiting off of. But when we make it clear and all the, all the beneficiaries know that the mission is this, we're gonna to try to solve this problem. And along the way, we need to have a lot of fuel. Yep. Because we need to, the nonprofit that fixes the problem for their town now can't fix it for all the towns. That's right. They don't have the profit or the fuel to scale it to the rest of the world. So there's this, so, so in my experience, working all the way from churches to charities to nonprofits to government, and then as an entrepreneur, I see that we have the most potential, like the people I would bet on in all the organizations are the young startups that have the ability to flex and test and experiment and fail, uh, that can slowly, as they gain profit, scale the solution to everybody in the world who wants or needs it, which we call marketing. Yep. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the big, enormous excitement is that the biggest problems in the world today are now the biggest marketplaces. Healthcare, education, energy, clean water, etc. So if you solve for some aspect of one of those, you have a global market. Mm -hmm. and, and that's incredibly exciting. And so a lot of the work we do uh, today, or I do, or say at XPRIZE, is how do you create marketplaces around these global problems? Mm -hmm. And we've been working with the UN on how do you think about that model around it. Right. And I'm sure the UN has their own difficulties being a large organization and tr trying to get the buy-in of all the stakeholders, especially. Outside of that, let's just say, the startups that are building things uh, that maybe, the, I imagine organizations starting to just acquire these startups and let them run independently. The, the question was, why are they creating their own? Can't they, can't they um, let the startups, startup world do what it does and gain the benefit at a certain point? In, in fact, I think it's the balance is tilting so dramatically that the more um, kind of sophisticated entrepreneurs and startups today refuse to be bought. Mm -hmm. Especially if they care about the solution. That yeah, they're exactly. They, and, they and know they that they're going to be the solar company that gets put out of business. They're going to get wiped out. So and why so would I do this? refuse the sale and, and unless big, they're Big companies have a hit tradition of kind of accidentally kind of totally killing the startups that they acquire. So it's a really magical thing today that the startups, uh, you, the WhatsApp is a great example. Right? The market value of WhatsApp was actually one and a half billion dollars when Zuckerberg came knocking on the door. And very quickly, Apple, Yahoo, Google found out, said, hey, we want to think about acquiring this thing. And the market value goes from one and a half to three to five to seven. The bid goes to nine to 12. And the founder is like, no, we don't want to sell. We have a massive purpose. Simple communication globally. If we sell to one of you guys, you're going to kill it. Mm -hmm. And so the bid got up to like 18 billion. And finally, the shareholders said, look, you're 15 times your market cap. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Um, and only after extracting a legal promise from Zuckerberg that he would do, like, leave them alone completely, did they agree. Uh, and now the, the, if Facebook is trying to pull it in, can't get, keep the sticky fingers off it. And mm -hmm. that's the, all the founders are leaving. Right. Uh, and so this is an exciting time because of that. The f f Tesla, Elon, refuses to sell to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's great. He even tried to buy back his own public company. Exactly. <laughs> uh, which causes troubles. Lots of. But I understand the tension. That used to be the, the dream, was that a uh, Silicon Valley right. startup would go all the way from startup to scaling, funding. And then get bought. You got your seed funding, your Series A, all this stuff, all the way up to an IPO. Uh, or getting bought by a big organization, but even ultimate, the IPO, going public. Right. And then the founders that are running these public companies are telling everyone, it was "Don't the, do this." It, usually, <laughs> it was the worst decision. Worst they thing ever we made. ever did is to go public or get acquired. Right. Yeah. Um, so the flexibility is gone. And the cool thing about it is that because you could just say, "Well, that's the way it tends to always work," but the speed of the growth of these startups allows them to become major, like WhatsApp, major players in a very small amount of time, where they haven't taken on a lot of investment and they haven't yeah. tied, tied a lot of loose strings to them just strings along the way of all the partners that have you know had the strings attached on their deals right uh, where your investors essentially control the future of the company because right. of the financial duress you're in at the early stages so if you can get through the early stage we tell a lot of startups like we're investors we love investing but we tell them the 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 last resort should be accepting investment yeah you know like it innovate you know test things scale things up when they're small kill things when they're young <laughs> right uh, you know so that you can actually keep doing that so that when you have something that's investable, the investor is accountable to the actual value in the company. Right. And you're not under financial duress where you're just willing to take any terms. Okay, so the David versus Goliath scenario that we see. Yep. 
is we're always betting on the Davids. So in every industry, uh, I was in publishing for quite some time and we saw a tech company come into publishing and me and my partner just like did this because we knew the tech, the publishing industry very well. It's almost like a bureaucratic, yep. centralized organization with a lot of legacy. Uh, we came into that industry and bet fully on digital audiobooks at a time when they were less than half the market. Right. And everyone thought we were kind of nuts. They were like, what are you doing for CDs and all this stuff? And we said, well, our authors don't seem to really care very much about that. And we think that it's going to be primarily digital. So we're just not taking on that business. And they're like, what are you doing with it? And I said, nothing. Well, why aren't you making CDs? Why aren't you doing this? We said, no, we think it's a distraction from the core business. And, and we actually were on a, a panel at one point with my partner and he got a little bit razzed for it. And there was one company that made all their money almost off CDs in libraries. And so he was kind of threatening the industry in a sense by saying that. But within three years, it was over 80%, over right. 85% digital. The whole industry transformed. Everyone was trying to you know, get more into digital and figure out what they were doing and figure out how to, you know, they had hundreds of employees sometimes in making CDs and everything. But it's important to just acknowledge the rapid pace of change in order that you don't have to renege on all your decisions you're making. Right. So all you're saying about what you said Elon Musk is uh, doing is easy is, is a little bit funny. But well, I mean, easy in the sense that you can his methodology is very simple. There's a clear methodology. Right. But it the, presupposes right. that one, like to forecast that way, that you believe the past. Yep. And, and in the audiobook industry, actually, we had this uh, annual report that would come out every once in a while. There was annual and there was a five year. And they were always projecting linear growth. Yeah. And we were only in the industry because we saw the exponential growth. Right. And, like we knew that this was going to happen. We had already seen it in all the other entertainment sectors on the way up from movies to music and then to audiobooks and, we, and ebooks actually first. Yeah. And, and then audio. And we were like, this is a very clear line that's going to happen. We have the forecast, but still, every time they would have an exponential growth in a year, they go back to a linear forecast. So this is the maybe the biggest insight I try and get across when I do my talks is that all of your experts in your industry project linearly. Every single one of them. Car industry, yeah, that's where cars are going to go. We'll get incremental effects here and there. A car will increase in battery range from 200 kilometers to 220 to 240 to 260. Mm. They can't conceive that it goes from 200 to 400 to 800. And uh, even if it has, even if it has, and, and there, I'll give you my famous uh, favorite anecdote around this. There's there's two of them. One is Vinod Khosla. So we saw exponential growth in mobile phones uh, from the year 2000 to 2010. Every year doubled. So we went from 100 million to 200 million to 400 to 800 to 1.6 billion. Very steady exponential growth. So he went back through the entire decade and tracked down all of the mobile industry expert analysts' forecasts. So in 2002, what did Gartner, Forrester, Jupiter, mm -hmm. McKinsey say would be the growth of mobile phones? So in 2002, they collectively predicted 16% growth in the mobile phone growth industry. It actually went up 100%, so they're off by, you know, like almost five, six X there. Okay. Except their next prediction wasn't 18% or 20%, it was 14%. So then it went up another 100%. So they thought, we already got the growth out We've of the way. We've got the growth. We've, it's got to level <laughs> off, right? And the next prediction after the next one was 12%. Went up another 100%. And in 2008, unable to spot three doubling patterns and cognitively digest that, they predicted 10% growth in the mobile phone industry. And it went up 100% again. Now, you're pretty off if you're off by 10x. You're predicting 10% and it grows 100%. Right. And you're the you, mobile industry expert analyst, right? At, at what, what point, point do you, you get fired? Up? And there's a fabulously <laughs> famous curve, but it's the exponential growth of solar energy over the last 20 years. And the predictions from the World Energy Outlook, from the World Energy Agency, saying what will be the growth of solar energy. And you can see every single point on this curve that goes like this, they're like this, every year, for 17 years in a row. Saying it's going to plateau. Saying it's, saying it's plateaued, we're now level. We'll yeah. never, never grow. Solar will never. In fact, some of them go down. Yeah. How do you predict solar goes down, blows my mind, and yet you see these lines. And it's you're like, too, it's, the past is too good to be true, that's therefore right. it's going to go down. Exactly, it has to happen. And so this is the, this is the, the immune system, essentially. This is the, the, what you have to fight when you go into a legacy organization and say, listen, guys, every, I did a talk for Idea City here this year, earlier this year, called Death to Corporations. And there's about six reasons that I can see that big organizations and big corporations will not survive the future. Mm. Uh, and and it's partly this mindset, partly the markets are collapsing, partly the speed of change is too much. It's a whole bunch of these. But in general, we have an, an existential threat for large operating companies mm -hmm. in the future.
So a lot of people uh, say successful entrepreneurs made a bunch of money uh, creating their own products or services, scaling them with the internet, low cost, low risk. There's a lot of people learning how to do that, primarily for personal gain, because yeah. they're trying to figure out, well, if I'm not going to work this job over here and make this much money, maybe I could make more over here and have a little bit of quality of life, which yeah. you know millennials and people my age also really enjoy. Uh, as a priority over earnings yeah. uh, is the quality of life. You know, for me, I have a couple kids and a wife, and I want to have time with them and not just you know work at my government job all the time. <laughs> um, and that's how I got into it. Um, but then once you have a little bit of capital, a little extra time, some great connections in the entrepreneur world, and you start to build a network, you see that there's a, a real potential for you to solve a major problem. Yeah. And there's, I feel, a responsibility when, yes. you, when you enter that role or enter that space, I don't project that responsibility onto anyone else, but I feel it myself. And, yeah. I, and I would, I encourage people to take that responsibility on because there's major problems that, that can be solved. And I don't want to be the person that just watched them all go to crap, watch the world slowly implode while I was holding back my ability to help. Yeah. Uh, so what are some examples? Uh, that's how I thought we could end off, is just some examples of the David's fighting Goliath-sized problems out there using a exponential slingshot. Yep. So I, I use the example of the Vietnamese fishermen, right? That's a classic example of what's happening across the world today. I think Africa is going to leapfrog the rest of the world in solar systems, etc. A lot of people say that because of what happened with phones. Is that yeah. why? But that, but, but just because when you have nothing, you can leapfrog the status quo, right? You would need a trillion dollars of infrastructure road building to put roads and highways across Africa to make it as sophisticated as, say, Europe or the U.S. But when you have drones, why the hell do you need to do that? Why would you put down roads across the continent when we know that's not going to be used? Mm -hmm. Let's leapfrog all of that to drones in the same way they leapfrog landlines and phones and went to a billion handsets. And so that possibility, I think, is going to happen with cryptocurrencies, with medical care, et cetera, et cetera. But you have to solve that old mindset, and especially in government, as you referred to mm -hmm. earlier. And so I think the work to be done today is to break from old legacy mindset thinking in government and regulatory bodies and go, you know what? We can actually do this in a radical way. So mm -hmm. just I'll give you, just drill into this for a second. So you take drones. Drones emerge and the FAA goes, oh my God, somebody could load up a drone with C4. We need to ban all drones. And what they then do, slowly open that tap over a 20 year period or so. And then society finally gets the benefit from the drones. Well, we don't have that time today. We've got major problems with climate change and other problems that we have to move innovation forward way faster than we've been doing it the way, et cetera. And um, if we don't, just to note, if we don't right here, yeah. say in North America, someone will, and then the government will be held accountable for not doing that. And it's going to—it's happening already. Crypto is an example with the Gibraltar example mm -hmm. you gave and others. But you take the use of drones. The Rwanda now has a drone corridor, a three-dimensional tube across the country if you are kind of constrain your drone to find that space, you have free uh, reign to do whatever you want. And we're going to see a lot more of that. But try and do that here, you've got a major challenge on your hands. You know, you've got all sorts of different regulatory levels. Is it operated the municipal or the provincial or the federal? Where the hell are you? It's, 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 it's chaos trying to navigate that. So I think we're going to see emerging markets leapfrog the status quo. I think we're going to see uh, new entrepreneurs blow open traditional domains um, Ethereum being just a small example, but Jack Andreka, a 14-year-old kid who invented a way of detecting pancreatic cancer early. Oh, I did see, I saw right. a YouTube video. Yeah, this is unbelievable. A 14-year-old kid, this is a, a disease with 98% mortality because we didn't have an early stage test. And he invented something that costs almost nothing that gives you an early stage test. So he's reduced single-handedly, this 14-year-old kid has gone from 98% mortality to 98% survival in pancreatic cancer. And he did it by searching Google, right? That just blows your mind in terms of what's possible. We should just turn the, find all these 14 to 20 year old kids and just turn the world over to them. They'll figure it out. We're the problem. All of the legacy thinkers in all the domains are the problem. Mm -hmm. And so when you can alleviate that problem, and I'll kind of, let me make this kind of really important point about the drone pattern. So the first instinct is ban all drones because we kind of are very security minded. We got to protect the public and we just go ban them. But you kill off all innovation uh, and the bad actor is not going to listen to the regulation anyway. Mm -hmm. So you don't stop the bad guy, but you stop all the good guys, mm -hmm. right? And so, and we've got this great data point that I've been drilling into. So we now have multiple systems in the world where you can, a human being can do equally good or bad 
uh, Craigslist, eBay. On eBay, I can mask my email address pretty easily, offer a MacBook on sale, you send me a thousand bucks and I disappear. I'm in Fiji on a beach, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, but we have a bunch of these, Craigslist, Kijiji here and others. So sociologists and anthropologists have now studied these systems in detail. Okay, here's an environment where a human being can do equally good or bad. What's the actual ratio? Mm -hmm. There's a great environment to test this. And across all of these systems, it seems the ratio is pretty consistent at about 8,000 to one. Wow. So on eBay, there's 8,000 constructive positive transactions to each negative. 8,000 to 8, 1. 8,000 to 1. So if you say drones are possible and you give that to the general public, if the pattern holds and we totally see there's no reason why it shouldn't, you'll see 8,000 positive applications for each negative. Mm -hmm. So what we should be saying with technology, like crypto, do anything you want with it. And then when we find negative use cases, because they're easy to spot, we'll police those. Right. But do whatever you want. That's what we should be doing. I mean, instead, what we do is ban everything, stop all. So the regulatory bodies, the countries, the regions, the governments, or the big companies that figure this out and say, do whatever you want. And the, in the Silicon Valley companies that are successful, like Zuckerberg saying to his Facebook developers, go live whenever you want. We trust you. Totally outperform the rest of the people in that category. Mm -hmm. We have lots of historical precedent for this. But trying to get that mindset into our older way of thinking, into that top-down hierarchy, mm -hmm. is the fundamental work to do today. Right, and with uh, the trusted internet on its way, with blockchain underlying Bingo. it, there will be, our projection is that the internet will be eaten. Uh, There's a quote from JW, uh, James Wallace. Uh, he said, uh, just like uh, Kevin Kelly said, software is eating the world. Yeah, Mark uh, Andreessen. Yeah, so JW says that blockchain is eating the internet. Yep. And at one point, you'll have to choose. Do you want to be part of the trusted internet yep. or, or the not trusted internet? Right. And where do you want to buy your stuff? Where do you want to find your mate? Where do you want to do all this stuff online? The trusted internet or the not trusted? And so I think the ratio will become less on the trusted internet and more in the not trusted. Totally. And it'll slowly dwindle away to a, a dark web or a yep. whatever you call that in the blockchain. The real internet. Yeah, yeah. the real internet. <laughs> Any other examples to finish off just on major, uh, the 14 year old kid is a brilliant one. I mean, it's a classic and it's worth telling the quick anecdote here. Um, his uncle died of pancreatic cancer. So he got really upset, personal motivation, et cetera. Why do you have to die? We don't have an early stage test. So he goes and downloads a bunch of clinical trial data from Google and starts running machine learning algorithms, finds a biomarker that would indicate pancreatic cancer. And then he says, can I detect this biomarker early? And literally does a bunch more Google searches and finds that carbon nanotubes might be a great way of detecting this thing. Writes a five-page thesis, sends it to the top 200 cancer researchers in the country and says, I need about four months of lab time to test this hypothesis. You know, do you have any extra space in your lab? The vast majority of these researchers look at this paper and go, he's 14. He's in grade nine. Kid doesn't have a medical degree, can't possibly figure this out. And to be really honest, I probably would have done the same, right? But drop it in the bin. One of them, Johns Hopkins, because he lived nearby. That's the only reason. They said, you know, bring, one of the, bring the kid in. They said to one of the researchers, chat with him, you know, hear him out, give him a mug with the logo on it, and send him on his way. Yeah. Um, and the researcher listens to him for a bit, goes, ha, huh, this guy's really thought about this. Kids really thought about this. They bring in all the other researchers. They talk to him. They gave him the lab space. And it turns out the kid is correct. Right. And so this is the, what's possible in the world today if the elder generation would listen to a Vitalik or listen to a Jack Andreka, find these kids and just figure out like how to how to just follow them. Right. And they will figure it out. I think of anybody under like 14 years old as a different species. Like they're not even human. Mm. They can natively multitask. They're digitally uh, totally uh, kind of connected in. Uh, it's a different world and we can take advantage of that in a really profound way. Right. And the drone story that you told earlier, the problem with drones, you mentioned, I've heard you say a different time about this story, I forget where it was, where there was a a big oh, problem. the mountain, yeah. Yeah, so this is the one of the, our sprints that we did in Medellin. Uh, it, it, right now, to get to the airport from in Medellin, the airport's in the next valley. So you have to take a switchback road up a mountain and down the other side. Uh, it's desperately dangerous. It's 40 minutes. And some truck skids out, and that's it. You can't get to the airport, like, for the day. <laughs> it's just a, just a bad outcome. Current proposal, let's drill a $20 billion tunnel through the mountain put the entire country in debt for this one tunnel. And the World Bank is here, yeah, we'll fund that. Totally old thinking, right? We're like, okay, wait a minute, let's look at the problem a bit, let's have our teams analyze it. And one of the proposals is, listen, if you have a, a drone system just carrying packages over back and forth, you'll take 40% of the trucks off the street like that. 
40% of the traffic, which is all the trucks carrying goods, you just have a cargo drone going back and forth, or even a blimp just carrying containers over the mountain and back, and you free up the road completely, and you totally solve that problem for literally about a 20th of the, pro of the other proposal. 5%. Yeah. Wow. So like, which do you want to do, right? And, and that kind of possibility is... And the World Bank was ready to write that $20 World Bank billion is really ready to fund check. that because they get, they get funding back. They get, they're the World Bank. They want to fund. They're only set up to fund these big $20 billion infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. If you say I have a problem that can be solved for a hundred grand or a hundred million, they're like, not interested. Mm -hmm. right? And so, so how can you fix the system and get people to recognize that you can solve these major systemic problems for almost nothing to them? Mm -hmm. And right. the way I see it happening, I worked in government for many years. I saw them, you could never get permission as like a startup or an entrepreneur. You could never get permission from the government to go and do innovation. Right. But as soon as you did it and it was working, they would be dying to jump on the exactly. bandwagon. They, yeah. they want you to be part of it. They'll fund it. They'll sponsor right. it. And, they'll, and the smarter ones are saying, we give you the permission to go try out crazy things and fail, et cetera. And then we'll figure out what to do with it later. Right, right. right. And I think that's the opportunity for governments around the world. And it's the best time in the history of mankind to be an entrepreneur. I know. And, and it, it just, it, it puzzles me that that reality hasn't settled in for a good chunk of society. Yes. And that's North American society, let alone other places. Yeah, I mean, Europe, like nightmare. Right. Yeah. I've been to Greece where there's, what was it, 40, when I was there, I think it was 40 something percent unemployment rate. And I thought, well, they must be doing education about like online businesses and how to tap into the global marketplace. And not one person I ever talked to had been aware of that. Yeah. It puzzles me. You think that the necessity would drive them to the end, and I'm sure they are doing more of that now. This, but... is, this is the cultural and mind shift, mind, mindset shift that has to take place. Mm -hmm. right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for jumping into all these crazy thought rabbit holes. <laughs> well, it was a great conversation, yeah, as I appreciate always. it. Thank you. All right. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We take every listener to this podcast very seriously, and we'd love to keep in touch with you directly. So please subscribe to our Scaling Impact community by subscribing to our email list at exv.ai forward slash podcast. That's exv.ai forward slash podcast.